you're in for a real treat today. Our kids are coming in. They're going to sing one of the songs they'll be doing in the kids' musical play tonight. So you're going to want to come back and hear the whole thing, but you're going to get a little sample of it right now. Why don't you give them a big church welcome as they come in, all right? Tonight, the Christmas Dream Team Parade, and they will be singing and acting tonight. It starts at six o'clock. It'll be finished well before seven. So come on out and join us tonight. All right. Anything y'all want to say? You want to say anything? Okay. <laughs> Isn't that good? All right. Come back tonight, 6 o'clock, for so much more. Way to go, guys. Y'all going to come back tonight? Okay, good, good. We're go if you show up, I'm showing up, okay? All right, guys. <laughs> See y'all in a little bit. Oh, it's going to be so much fun. We hope you'll come join us tonight. Good morning and Merry Christmas. It is great to see you all out today. There's nothing like kids to put a smile on your face. Uh, now, sometimes you scare them to death. They forget to smile when they're up here, all right? Uh, and I always love to tell them, this is what I get to look at every single Sunday, all right? Uh, <laughs> So, when you come back tonight, be sure you smile at them, all right? That'll make them smile back at you a whole lot easier. But we're glad you're here. If you are a guest today, you honor us this Christmas season by joining us for this Sunday of worship. I'm glad you're here. There are some communication cards in the pew in front of you. We love for our guests to fill those out. Put them in an offering bag when it comes by. We promise we are not going to beat on your door. We're not going to bother you on the phone. But through the mail, we're going to send you information that tells you about the church, about our staff, about the ministries you can engage in or services that you can attend and hopefully answer most of your questions. Those cards are also for our church family for prayer requests, updates, meetings with staff, things you think we need to know. Uh, please take the opportunity to do that and then drop that in the offering bag as it comes by. 
Um, let me highlight just a couple of uh, announcements and then a couple of prayer requests and we'll get engaged in our worship this morning. Um, as I already told you, this evening there is a service here at 6 o'clock. We normally have Sunday evening services, but tonight we'll be in the sanctuary and it's going to be our kids' musical play. This afternoon at 12.30 over in the bridge, if you want an update on what the Mexico mission trip is going to be like during Easter week, you can show up for that information meeting today at 12.30. Angel tree gifts are due. If you picked up an angel off of the trees uh, a month ago, six weeks ago, when they were on the stage, those need to be brought back. If you didn't bring it this morning, bring it back this evening, all right? Uh, those have to be organized for distribution during this next week. Uh, also, pledges for our Neonan uh, Ivory Coast Africa students and our Fulsome to Forgiven pledges that you may have ma made, those are due by the end of this month, preferably by next Sunday, because we'd love to make that presentation uh, to Tim Kepler when he's back with us from Japan, uh, and he'll be with us on Christmas Eve Sunday morning. So we would love to be able to make that presentation that day. For our 55 and older group, uh, Seniors Lunch Bunch is going to be this Tuesday, the last one of 2017. Come enjoy uh, a festive Christmas uh, seniors lunch on Tuesday the 12th. Widows Lunch Bunch, you are having lunch next Sunday. The information, time and place is in the bulletin. Please take the opportunity to read it. We're going to kick off 2018 on the right note. Uh, that first Sunday of the year is going to be Baptism Sunday. So we're going to be those who've invited Christ in their life in either our Sunday school classes, our morning services, or for a few, those who maybe received Christ years ago but never took that next step in baptism and they've decided they're ready to. We're going to be celebrating that with them on the Sunday morning services uh, the first Sunday of the year. Uh, please take note uh, in your bulletin of times and services over the next couple of weeks. Next Sunday is our Christmas Choir and Message Sunday. Uh, all three of our morning services will be in the sanctuary, 8, 9.30, and 11. Slightly different times next Sunday, all right? 8, 9.30, and 11. Uh, Sunday evening, next Sunday, will be at its regular time of 6 o'clock over in the bridge as they are looking at uh, uh, Love All, all right? That's, uh, am I correct on that? I believe it's love all. Yeah, it's what's in there. in the Advent conspiracy theme. And so come and join our high school kids as they lead in worship. And Mark, as he shares a message about love all. Then the following Sunday, December the 24th, services will be at their normal time on Sunday morning. I know there's some rumors out there. Actually, they're not rumors. There. Some churches are canceling church on Christmas Eve. Okay? We're not. All right? Now, if you've got family and stuff and you can't get them to come with you, that's okay, but we're, we're going to be here, and it'll be our three regular services. Kepler will be with us, leading us in incredible Christmas music on Christmas Eve morning, and those services will be 8, 9, 15, and 10, 45. That Sunday, Christmas Eve, that afternoon at 4 o'clock, will be the wrap-up of Advent Conspiracy, where they will worship fully. So a little different time for that service at 4 o'clock on Christmas Eve. Then we will have what we've done for about 22 years here, our regular Christmas Eve late night service at 9 p.m. Uh, and so join us from 9 to 10 o'clock for our late night Christmas Eve service. All right, December the 31st, all the Sunday morning services are as normal, and we will not be having a New Year's Eve Sunday evening service. All right, so you get the night off. Uh, our pastoral staff thought it would be a great idea to do a 10 to midnight service. I thought it was a great idea, all right, and uh, the, the rest of the staff didn't think that was such a great idea, uh, nor did our wives. So uh, we, <laughs> we, uh, we, we decided we'll give you the night off, all right, uh, and be ready for all the uh, festivities on New Year's Day. We still hope you will have a safe, sane, and very sober New Year's Eve, all right, and then uh, after that we will see you the next year. So those are our updates in terms of things happening the next couple of weeks. Uh, as most of you know, this is uh, mine and Shaw, our, new, our, our first time in our new home. Uh, we are now uh, fully engaged in the decorations, all right, and all the drive-bys and the walk-throughs. Uh, the last two evenings, we've sat out on our front driveway, a fire pit out. Um, I've enjoyed a fine cylindrical object and <laughs> greeted people as they came by and passed out some candy canes to some of the kids. 
Uh, we're loving it. I'm having a great time doing that. Several of you from our church family came by as well. Uh, you can find our house by finding the Grinch's house, all right? Uh, the Grinches are the Belchers from our church as well, and we are just right next door. But several have come by. We've enjoyed visiting with you. Um, I, I'm out off and on during the week, but Friday and Saturday night, trying to hang out and meet people and, and share, the, hopefully, the spirit of Christmas as they go by. So uh, we would love to have you come by and, and do that. A um, couple of families I do want you to remember to pray for Bill Yelkin. Bill has been part of our church family off and on for about, really, 15 years probably. Uh, no, a normal part of our 8 o'clock service. Uh, Bill has run into some health challenges. Um, Bill and I actually went to high school together. Uh, I've known Bill a long, long time. Um, Bill loves Harleys, and Bill loves music, all right? He played in a band for many, many years, uh, is a guitar player. Um, Bill battles demons. Uh, when he came to know Christ uh, and when he walks in a healthy relationship with Christ, those demons are kept at bay. Uh, when, when things get kind of convoluted in his life and he gets too busy and, and ignores that relationship, those demons tend to come back. And those demons for him are alcohol. Uh, they control him. He doesn't control them. And his life spirals out of control. And that's happened recently. And um, last year, he had a couple of uh, toes off of one of his uh, feet amputated. Um, that put him in a pretty deep depression for a while, though physically he was doing very, very well. Um, it's come to head again, and uh, on Friday, they were uh, to have amputated his foot above his ankle. Um, and uh, Steve and I have been to see him uh, a couple of times each. Uh, it was supposed to have been Thursday, got proposed on Friday, uh, because he mentally and emotionally wasn't ready for it, so we had some good conversations. Um, really, for Bill, where he is at this moment in his life is um, he's ready to die, he, he, he has a relationship with Jesus. He said, Tim, heaven just looks so much better than earth. And so really what, what Bill is facing right now, and, and don't misunderstand me, I think all of us need to look forward to heaven. We don't need to be afraid to die. But, but the flip side, while we're anticipating heaven, we don't need to be afraid to live. And that's where Bill is at this moment. He's, 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 he's more afraid to live than he is to die. And so be praying for him as he goes through his recovery. Uh, he's at St. Agnes. Some of the people who know him at 8 o'clock service are going to go check on him this week. Uh, but just, I really want you to, to, to pray for Bill in this season of recovery, that it's not only a physical recovery, but it's also a, a spiritual and mental and emotional recovery for him. The doctor assured him that he can get him a prosthetic that will put him on a Harley again, all right? And that cheered him up a bit that day. So uh, please be praying for him. Uh, the other family is the Weaver family. Uh, John uh, recently retired from Clovis PD. Uh, his wife, Carolyn, uh, many of you will know her from Buchanan High School as Bianchi. Uh, her and John have been married for a little over a decade now. But uh, anyway, John's mom went under hospice care. She's 92 years old. Uh, she loves Jesus. I spent some time with her Friday afternoon. She loves Jesus. Uh, she's ready. Uh, she had a daughter coming in on Saturday, and she said, I see my baby girl again. I'm ready to go see my husband. And uh, so just be praying for them as during this season they're, they're going through that transition with, uh, her name is Barbara. So if you just remember to pray for them, I know they would appreciate that. I'm glad you're here. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our tithes and offering, and our worship team is going to come back and lead us in, in worship today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so very, very grateful for your Son, the Lord Jesus. It is during this season that uh, we recognize his birth. But Father, his birth would have been absolutely meaningless if it wasn't for the rest of the life he lived, the crucifixion that he willingly chose, his burial in a tomb for three days, and then Father, if it was not for a Sunday morning called Easter, Easter because a resurrection occurred. If it wasn't for all of that, this, this birth in Bethlehem we celebrate so big every single year would be absolutely meaningless. We would never give a nod towards this. There, was, there wouldn't be such a thing as Santa Claus. There, there wouldn't be any of the Christmas carols that we have. This is about the beginning of the most incredible life that has ever been lived the most fearsome death that's ever been died, the most depressing funeral that's ever occurred, and then, Father, the glorious resurrection. 
is what makes Christmas Christmas. May we not forget that. And Lord, if, if there are those who are with us today that have just never thought through that whole process, I hope, I hope that in the adventure of this morning, they won't be in awe of what takes place at New Hope today, but they will be in awe of the life of Jesus Christ and what it means. A babe born to die to give to me what I could never ever earn or buy and that is forgiveness and everlasting life what an incredible gift and father for those of us who believe that we now demonstrate in one small way God thank you for showing up today we're glad we're glad you're listening all right we are so glad you are listening and um, th thank you that we have an opportunity to give testimony to our trust and dependence upon you, not only by placing our faith in you, but, Father, as we give, we say that we trust you with our lives and we give to you graciously and generously. Thank you for the joy of this season. We trust you with Bill's needs and we trust you with the Weaver family needs, Lord. And we say thanks in advance for your strength, sufficiency, and encouragement that you bring during this time in their lives. For other needs that are very present that we don't know about, but you do. You know about them intimately. Thank you that we can trust you with all of them. In the name of Christ, we lift you up. Amen. Amen. I think that's one of the purposes of Christmas, is to remind us of this beautiful name of Jesus Christ. So we were uh, engaged in that process of worship just now. I was thinking about how there's so much in our world that want to distract us from that focus and that attention. And uh, if we're not careful, we can begin to feel sorry for ourselves. I mean, we look around and the, the things in the newspaper, it's filled from sex scandals, the marketplace, politicians. We look at the rumors of Korea and Russia and China. We read and hear about the fires, Southern California and Northern California. And while we're having fires, other parts of the country are experiencing record snowstorms and without light and power. And we have all these things that distract us from the beautiful name of Jesus. Those things I mentioned don't even include the things just in our own personal lives that go on. Guy losing his foot. Family going through hospice. Layoffs at Christmas time. And as I stood there and thought about that, um, I thought it was no different that first Christmas season. You understand, they didn't know to call it Christmas then. This whole thing called Bethlehem and the manger and the shepherds and the angels. No, nobody then knew that was Christmas. They didn't know for 2,000 years after that, people would be having these big celebrations, all right, about real life that went on. But think, think briefly of the distractions then. Roman Empire was oppressive. Babies were being slaughtered. Taxes had been raised and were being collected at the time. That's why Joseph and Mary were heading to Bethlehem. Then think about the personal things of Mary and Joseph. I mean, a rushed marriage, hush-hush marriage. I mean, think about this. This is ironic to me. Jesus' parents had a shotgun wedding. <laughs> That, that, that one kind of boggles my mind, but they, they, they did. And, and, and now they're having to go pay taxes at a time when a baby's going to be born and they couldn't even find a place to stay overnight. They, they, they had to hang out in a barn. I mean, lots of distractions. And yet they never lost focus. They never lost focus. And that will be our challenge during this particular Christmas season is, is to go through this Christmas remembering what a beautiful name it is. And, and, and sometimes those of us in the church have to realize that 
Sometimes religion has marred that beautiful name because people tend to think about Baptist or Presbyterian or Methodist or Pentecostal or TV evangelist or things that are connected and, 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 we, and we get so distracted from solely who is Jesus. That's what Christmas is all about. And none of the last five minutes has a thing to do with today's sermon. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> I invite you, if you want to find the book of Romans chapter 12 and the book of Philippians chapter 2, and some of you are saying, and what do those passages have to do with Christmas? Well, hopefully it'll make sense in just a moment. So Romans chapter 2, 12, and Philippians chapter 2, if you want to turn there, please. Mary Ellen Chase was um, an English teacher at the university level and also an author of many, many books in the early part of the 20th century, a little before I was born. She has a great quote in one of her books that says, Christmas is not a date. It is a state of mind. Christmas is not a date. It's not December 25th. It is a state of mind. And I would suggest to you what December the 25th should do for us is prompt us to think about what is our state of mind. Much like communion reminds us as believers of this incredible gift that God has, has provided for us so that we don't forget the value of it, we share in communion throughout each year. And so Christmas is a time for the whole world, not just the church, but the whole world to stop and contemplate what is my state of mind. There were two young boys who were spending the night at uh, their grandparents' house one week. It was the week before Christmas. At bedtime, the two boys knelt down by the side of their bed as they did in their own home, and they said their evening prayers. The younger one began praying at the top of his lungs. I pray for a new bicycle, and, and, and God, I'd like a new Nintendo. And his older brother leaned over and nudged him and said, Brother, why are you shouting? God isn't deaf. To which the little brother replied, No, but Grandma is. Uh, state of mind, state of mind about Christmas. Um, there's an interesting verse in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Most of us are very familiar with verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. But verse 2 I find very thought provoking at Christmas time. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. What is this world's pattern for Christmas celebration? I think the application for us here is is, is our celebration going to be different and distinctive in any way from the way in which the rest of the world chooses to celebrate? I believe Paul's direction to us is don't be conformed by the pattern of this world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. Mary Ellen Chase said Christmas is a state of mind. I think Paul is saying the very same thing right here. Then, if you'll allow this to take place, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. The key thought of what I want to try to get across to you in the next, you know, 25 or 30 minutes, hopefully. The 25 or 30 minutes is the hopeful part. <laughs> is if Christians celebrate Christmas the way the rest of the world does, then is it honoring to God? And I would suggest to you it's probably not because there's not much room for Christ in the world's celebration other than the occasional polite reference to a baby Jesus. So the thrust of what I kind of want to talk about is how do we live differently during this season that will change the way in which we may live differently for the rest of the year. Uh, I'd like to visit about how we can go about living a biblically accurate Christmas attitude throughout our entire life. To do that, I want us to look at another passage that Paul wrote. At a first glance, it doesn't look much like a Christmas message, but I will suggest to you, I hope it is, that's found in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8. And Paul writes this, Do nothing out of selfish ambition 
Application for this at the moment is don't celebrate Christmas out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Uh, hey, I might let slip to somebody what I'm buying them because it might change what they're choosing to buy me. But in humility, in other words, I'm choosing to give whether there is anything given back to me at all. In humility, I will consider others better than ourselves. Please understand, this doesn't mean they are better. But you have such a humble attitude, you will consider every one of them better than you. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude, remember Mary Ellen Chase? Christmas is not a date, it's a state of mind. Paul is saying your attitude, your state of mind should be the same, not a little bit like or kind of, but it should be the same as who? Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or boasted about, but made himself Nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, even being born in a barn, being made in human likeness, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of a cross. My intent this morning is to give you at least three suggestions to live Christmas differently than the rest of the world with the hope that as others see what God is doing in us, they will become hungry and thirsty for the God who lives within us. So here's the first challenge, I believe, outlined by Paul in these verses in Philippians. Number one, we need to set aside, and this will require a willful, conscious choice. It won't happen by accident for most of us. We must set aside selfishness. Do nothing, Paul said, out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Can I get it? Am, am I supposed to figure out how I can get away with a little bit of selfishness? <laughs> Thank you, Allie. Yeah. Um, now, this passage says, do nothing. There's no, no exceptions here. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. This is kind of a hard one. It's hard not to be selfish at all. For all of us have moments in our life, maybe every single week, maybe every single day, where we feel like we deserve a little something more. Whether it's a material thing or whether it's respect from somebody or maybe it's just a little bit of rest. I mean, I'll be honest, there are times my phone rings and I say, God, I don't deserve this. I deserve rest. It was a long day and a short night yesterday, Lord. I, somebody else can handle this. Our culture tells us that we're out to look out for number one. 70s, 80s, lots of books, lots of seminars done on looking out for number one, many books written on that subject. And, and you know what I've come to the conclusion? They're right. We do need to look out for number one. The problem is we're just mixed up about who number one is. See, I think that's where the, the, the problem is. Um, hey, I deserve this promotion. I, I deserve to pull somebody down so I can climb up. I deserve this education. I deserve this raise. I deserve this inheritance. No, you deserve death. And because of Jesus, he offers us life. We deserve worse than what we have, but because of Jesus, he gives us what we don't deserve. His love, His honor, His blessings. Jesus said we're to love the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. And I'm kind of the opinion that, it's that if that's really where our priority is, then it's really kind of hard to get stuck on ourselves. And so I would suggest to you, if we get stuck on ourselves, we probably are not loving Jesus in the way in which He asks us to. And the second part of that verse where Jesus says we are to love God with all that we are, he then gives us that next phrase, to love our neighbor as ourself. I, uh, as most of you know, so that I moved from the country into the city. Um, I love the country. 
I'm starting to like the city. Okay? Um, let me tell you what I'm really loving right now, though. I'm, 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 I'm loving Christmas time. I am. Set out last night, uh, fire pit out in the front driveway, and, and, and Joe and John came over. We had a little cylindrical object. For those of you who haven't been around, that's a cigar. Um, and, and other friends came over, and we visited and snacked and greeted people, gave peppermint candy canes out to kids as they came by. Uh, folks from church stopped by. It was great fun. But, but let me tell you what's been most fun about this whole process, starting with, with decorating to being out on some of the evenings. This would have never happened in the country. I knew several neighbors out there, but I really only knew the one on my left and the one on my right because we're about 200 yards apart. It's hard to make connections 300, 400 yards away. After 29 years, you wave and, you know, you recognize. But, man, we, we knew Marvin and we knew, knew, knew Tish and Joe on the other side. And, you know, I miss them. But, but now we're meeting not just... Night before last when we were out, the, the, the two neighbors who live behind our backyard off of each corner stopped by and said, hey... New neighbors, welcome to the community. We had a chance to meet them. And others from another block over, hey, we, we heard you, you're here. Whoa, wow, you're getting into this light thing pretty quick. You're getting to meet neighbors. Um, the folks who live right next to us, uh, not the Belchers, the other side. Um, isn't this cool? Their last name is Sinner. <laughs> and, and when I first, first had a chance to meet her, um, uh, we, we actually hadn't moved in yet. We were showing some relatives who were from out of state the, the house that we were going to get in about a week, and we'd gotten permission to, to show them through the house, and we come out, and, and this, this new neighbor of ours, her dog was out barking at me, and I said, oh, maybe I better introduce myself, and I said, we're your new neighbor, and, and she's lived there 20, how long, 25, 6, 7 years, somewhere like that, and, 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 and she said, well, where's Dorothy? I was the one who had to tell her that her neighbor of 25 years had died and gone to heaven. And, 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 and she said, oh, you're the Belcher's Pastor Tim. I said, yeah, I hope that's a good thing. And, and, <laughs> and she said, oh, and she started laughing, cracking up. And I said, uh, what's a, she said, this is hilarious. A pastor living next to sinners. I love this. <laughs> And, and so last night I had the opportunity to walk over because they had it set up for a whole bunch of people to come out on their patio out front and, and we were kind of set up for a real small gathering and so I walked over and I said, okay, is this going to be the front yard party off, the sinners against the saints, you know, to see who's... And, 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 and then later the husband comes over to check things out. And, but, but see, learning to love, your, to connect... Shelly and Kathy walked around the neighborhood and saw all the decorations last night. Shelly came back with this great idea. I think you ought to do it, babe. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was this great idea, all right, that so many of our neighbors are, are celebrating Jesus in their decorations and yard art and stuff. Is just, just send them a note saying, hey, thanks. Thanks that you're really keeping Christmas Christmas. Appreciate you doing that. But just love your neighbor who I have not met yet as you love yourself. That requires selflessness set aside. The, the second thing is lift others up. When, when, we're, when we don't put ourselves in first place, it's so much easier to lift others up. In humility, consider others better than yourself. Here's how... Uh, a paraphrase of the Bible that's pretty popular. It's called The Message, done by Eugene Peterson. This is how he puts this phrase. He says, put yourself aside and help others get ahead. I, I also like the New American Standard translation of this passage. Regard one another as more important than yourself. What I want to talk about is the way we talk others up and try to increase their worth in their own eyes and in the eyes of others. And we do this to their face, and we also ought to be doing it behind their backs. How many of you remember the football player Gail Sayers? Okay, you got to be about my age or older, or you have to have seen the movie, all right, which is out. It's a, it's a great movie. If you haven't ever seen it, uh, probably on Netflix. 
Brian Song, yeah, good job. All right, some of you remember that. Uh, do you remember what team that the uh, Hall of Famer uh, running back played for? Chicago Bears. Yeah, that was too bad, but... Um, <laughs> Gail Sayers not only was known as a great football player, but he was also known for his friendship with a fellow player by the name of Brian Piccolo. Brian Piccolo was battling cancer as Sayers was coming back from a very, very serious knee injury. The movie Brian's Song was based not so much on their football careers as it was on their friendship. And that story typifies what I really am trying to talk about today. Each one of these men had their own struggles in attempting to get back to the game they loved so much. And in Piccolo's case, his struggle was for his very life. They constantly pushed each other, lifting each other up when they were down, putting aside their own agendas for the sake of the other one. In one particular incident, Gail Sayers brought up Brian's name. And I'm going to quote to you from Gail Sayers' book. The title of that book was, I Am Third. Okay, some of you have seen street signs and things out called I Am Second. It wasn't original with that guy. It was taken from the title of this book, I Am Third. And this comes from Scripture. Here's what Sayer said in his book. He said, at the end of May, I came into New York to attend the Professional Football Writers' annual dinner and to receive the George Hallis Award as the most courageous player in pro football. I had wanted Brian Piccolo to attend with me if he was strong enough, but the day I arrived in New York was the day that Brian and his wife, Joy, left the hospital to return home. He had finished a series of cobalt treatments, and the doctor said he needed to spend a few weeks at home resting, then return to the hospital for more treatment. One reason that I wanted Brian with me at the banquet was I intended to give to him the trophy right after it was presented to me. But at least I was able to tell the audience something about my friend, Brian Piccolo. He has the heart of a giant, I said, and that rare form of courage that allows him to kid himself and his opponent cancer at the same time. He has the mental attitude that makes me proud to have a friend who spells out the word courage 24 hours a day, every day of his life. Sayer said, I concluded by saying, you all flatter me by giving me this award, but I can tell you here and now, I accept this award for Brian Piccolo. Brian Piccolo is the man of courage who should receive the George Hallis Award this year. It may be mine tonight, but it will be Brian Piccolo's for all of his tomorrows. I love Brian, and I'd like all of you to love him too. Tonight, when you hit your knees, please ask God to love on him. Where have those football players gone? For I am third. The title of the book is based on Gail Sayers' credo. The Lord is first, my family and friends are second, and I am third. It's hard to be selfish when you're third. It's hard to be selfish when you're considering the needs of others before your own. Let's make the effort to lift other people up. Take a moment to examine your own life by asking a few questions today. Number one. And I, a person who would be characterized as concerned with the well-being and the success of others. Number two, am I a person who is genuinely excited about the success of others? Or am I constantly using one-upmanship to prove that I am just as good or better than another person? I hate being selfish. I hate it when I see it in others, and I get angry when I find it in myself. I found it there this week. I went to a funeral. And somebody leaned over and said, you do better funerals. And for a moment, I started critiquing the pastor in front of me. And God quickly brought shame. Do you understand what I mean by that? No matter what someone says they have or have done, when we think we have something just a little bit better, 
That is selfish. Third question. Can I be a second stringer when it comes to recognition? Am I happy to let others have the spotlight even if it was my efforts that might have got them there? There have been two men in my life who typify that for me. One has been my dad. Number two is a gentleman that some of you have heard me talk about here on numerous occasions. Um, he's in heaven. Um, he was one of my professors when I was in Bible college, my favorite professor in Bible college, and, and, and Jack Williams became my biggest cheerleader to the last week of his life. I have a file of emails of Jack lifting me up for the last 20 years. He did it for 40 some odd. But we didn't have email back then. My mother had a file of, of letters and notes, some type, some handwritten, some on the back of napkins that Jack Williams had written as encourager to mom. Shelly's got a file on her computer. Last 10 years, she got from Jack. Jack not only modeled it, but one of the sermons. We, we remember preachers that we've enjoyed, but let's be honest, y'all probably don't remember very many sermons you've heard me preach. You, you don't. We, 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 we remember principles we hear there. Maybe there's one or two that really stand out we hold on to, but uh, man, I heard Jack preach a lot. One stands out. One I'll never forget. Jack Williams preached on the message of it's great to play second fiddle. It's great to sit in the second chair. And he looked at characters out of the Bible. John the Baptist played second fiddle to Jesus. Elisha was always in the shadow of Elijah. Nine disciples were in the shadows of James and John and Peter. Jack was dean of students, been hired by the president of the college I attended. Jack did that for um, about 12 years, I believe. Jack played second fiddle to Wade Jernigan. From, from there, Jack became the uh, assistant to the executive director of the denomination that we were all a part of at the time. Jack served as the assistant to the executive director for probably 31, 32 years. His name was Melvin Worthington. There's lots of people in that circle who knew Wade and Melvin. They didn't know Jack. And the only reason those men were the successes they were were because of Jack Williams. You would find Jack in a back room, never in a front room. You found Jack in a back office, never the front office. You found Jack doing the grunt work and the best work. And other men got credit for it. As many of you know, it's, it's going to be two years this coming March, May. Jack went to heaven in his sleep. I was brokenhearted because of circumstances. I could not get to his funeral. But I think my heart was more broken this week. When Shelly told me that she had gotten an email from Janice that said they had finally buried Jack, taken her two years trying to get permission to bury him at a church cemetery that Jack wanted to be buried in, And the way the email sounded is there were less than five people present. Not even his family members were there except his wife. But you know what? Jack would not have been hurt or discouraged or depressed. He would have written note to encouragement of those who should have been there and said, man, thank you for doing what God's called you to do where you are. Jack knew how to recognize and lift up everybody else around him. And I pray his tribe will increase. Here's a related question. If you're one in the spotlight, 
Are, are we quick to recognize publicly those who have helped us to not do so would smack of pride and selfishness. Brian Piccolo was not a first string player for the Bears. He was not the standout that Sayers was, but Gale would have given his own life for Brian if he could have. He wanted the world to know that without Brian, he would not have been the player that he was. To live differently about Christmas, we need to set aside selfishness and lift others up. And the third way to live differently about Christmas is to reflect the example of Christ. As Paul talks about in verses 5 through 8, your attitude should be the same as Jesus. Being in the very nature God did not consider equality something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being in human likeness, being found in the appearance, he humbled himself as a man and became obedient to the death of a cross. I find three quick lessons we can learn from to allow Christ to express himself in a meaningful way through us, not only at Christmas, but throughout life. The first is this. Jesus volunteered. Jesus wasn't pressed into service to become our Lord and Savior. The scripture says before the foundations of the world, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit had a conference. And they knew that once creation took place that there would be a fall. And Jesus said, Father, here I am. Send me. Though we know this is going to end in dismal frustration and failure, we have a plan. And God, I'll do the plan. It wasn't a sugar-coated plan. The plan was death. Jesus knew it, and he said, here I am. He volunteered for service. He knew what was coming, and he said, Father, I'll go. When we get opportunities in our life to shine for Christ, our actions, our attitudes, our words, or whatever it is, that God may say, hey, I got something for you. Does our hand go up and say, Father, here I am. And me. Send me across the street to my neighbor with a bowl of soup because they're sick. Well, here I am to tell that guy who holds the same management position in the company that I do, and we're both vying for the, the promotion, that I'm praying for God's best in his life in this process. If God's gifted me to sing. Am I using my talents to bring glory to him? If God's gifted me to play, am I using that? If 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 I know some scripture and I could teach a Sunday school class, if, if I know how to bake, am I sharing meals with those who need? Jesus not only volunteered, but he also became relevant to those he was trying to reach. I'm going to take just a moment or two, camp out here for a second. Remember, Jesus is God, but he became a man. Why? Why? He needed to be relevant to us so we could connect as God on a mountaintop that we couldn't recognize like Moses was we could never connect so Jesus said I'll be a man I'll go through everything humanity does and I'll connect um, Aaron McManus pastor of a church down in LA uh, I think he's still there called mosaic says the incarnation of Jesus Christ is God's undeniable evidence that relevance to culture is not optional. And what that means is sometimes we have to get out of our comfort zone, guys, to find out what's relevant to our, our family members, to our neighbors, to our friends. And I'm in a suit today. Often I'm not. Do you think it's because I don't like wearing suits? Quite frankly, guys, I'm as comfortable in a suit as I am in a pair of Wranglers. Almost. <laughs> How well do you think if I walk down Pulaski and I'm always dressed like this, I'm going to connect with folks? <laughs> Man, those are times for low ropers and wranglers and a belt buckle. And I'm starting to develop that hangover, the belt buckle thing that so many cowboys have. <laughs> so I'm, real, I'm, I'm doing that for relevance. Yeah, you're so kind. You're lifting me up. You're, you're, you're carry, carrying out the sermon here. Thank you. Um, yeah. But guys, we, we, we have to figure this thing out a bit. We, we have to learn to speak 
the language Jesus did, he connected with where people were. I mean, remember Luke 15, 1 and 2, it says, Now the tax collectors and the sinners were gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teacher of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Let the same attitude of Jesus Christ be in you and me. Hey, I, that doesn't mean that I have to go get drunk with sinners so I can relate to them about Jesus Christ. But it might mean I need to be able to be comfortable sitting in a bar. It might mean that I don't have to give them a list of don'ts before I share with them the one who is life. He's far better to teach people what the don'ts are than you and me. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a rapper. I tried that once on a Sunday sermon. Y'all remember that? I did a little, did a little rap thing, and that was fun. I'm probably not going to connect to folks who are connected to rap, but you know what? I'm glad called, God has called other Christians who can do that, and he connects to them. And those of us who don't like rap shouldn't be mad at those who are doing what God says to do. Find a way to connect! Amen. And we need to do that. God often calls people to become like the people we're trying to reach. Paul said in the ninth chapter of 1 Corinthians, though I'm free, I belong to no man. I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those who aren't Jews, I become like them so I can win them. To the weak, I become weak to win them. I become all things to all men that I might possibly save some. We wisely choose to think about how to connect our faith with those around us. We need to do that. Here's the final lesson. Jesus was obedient to the will of the Father. He went through the Garden of Gethsemane before he went to the cross, and it's there that he said, Father, not my will, but yours be done. You see, my will is I'd love to get out of California. God's will is I'm not finished with you in Clovis yet. I wish I could just cut a big circle around Clovis and pick us up and move us somewhere. There's all kinds of things that you and I might like and wish we could do, and we might even think we deserve the right to do it, but does it fit in with not my will, but yours be done? Let me wrap this up. The attitude in us that Paul talks about, this kind of attitude that uh, that 20th century author, come on, page turn, Mary Ellen Chase, Christmas is not a date, but it's a state of mind. If that state of mind is going to become the mind of Christ functional in us, then, then, then the attitude that must be, be true at Christmas time as well as the rest of the year is, is we've got to move away from the manger. The manger is just the introduction. We've, we've got to get past the cross into an empty tomb. We've got to understand there is a living Savior who lives within us. We've got to get back from an immature faith and beyond an immature faith to a growing faith. Let's live differently this Christmas and this coming year. And let's start today. Let me wrap this up with a story. As I told the 8 o'clock service, I'm not sure this story has anything to do with the message I just preached to you. It's just the first time I read it was this week, and it's a really good, good Christmas story. It is so good, and it does carry out the theme of what I preached to you, and that is being selfless, lifting others up, because the person who wrote this didn't even put their name to it. It's written by Mr. or Miss Anonymous. But I think it does connect. Listen to what the story says. I remember my first Christmas with Grandma. I was just a kid. I remember tearing across town on my bike to visit her on the day that my big sister dropped the bomb. There is no Santa Claus. Even dummies know that, brother. My grandma was not the gushy kind. She never had been. I fled to her that day because she knew how to talk straight to me, and I knew grandma always told the truth, and I knew that the truth always went down a whole lot easier when swallowed with one of grandma's world-famous cinnamon buns. <laughs> I knew they were world-famous because grandma said it was true. Grandma was home when I got there, and the buns were still warm. And between bites, I told her everything my sister had told me. Grandma was ready for my no Santa Claus speech. She snorted, that's ridiculous. Don't believe it. That rumor's been going around for years, and it makes me plain mad. Now put on your coat and let's go. Go where, Grandma? I hadn't even finished my second world-famous cinnamon bun yet. Where it turned out to be Kirby's General Store, the one store in town that had a little bit of just about everything. It was a precursor to Walmart. 
As we walked through the doors, Grandma handed me $10. That was a bundle back in those days. Take this money, she said, and buy something for somebody who really needs it. I'll wait for you in the car. And then she turned and walked out of Kirby's. I was only eight that day. I'd often gone shopping with my mother, but I'd never shopped for anything all by myself. The store seemed big and crowded, full of people scrambling to finish their shopping. And for a few moments, I stood there, confused, clutching this $10 bill, wondering what should I buy and who should I buy it for. I thought of everybody I knew, family, close friends, neighbors, people at church, kids that were my best friends. I just about ran out of thoughts when suddenly I remembered Bobby Decker. Bobby Decker was the kid at school with bad breath and messy hair. He sat right behind me in Mrs. Pollock's second grade class. Bobby Decker did not have a coat. I knew that because he never went out to recess during the winter. His mother always wrote a note that said, Bobby has a cough, please keep him indoors today. All of us knew he didn't have a cough, but he didn't have a coat either. I fingered the $10 bill with excitement, and I said, I'm going to buy Bobby Decker a coat. I settled on a red corduroy one that had a hood on it. It looked really warm, and he would love that. Is, is this a Christmas present for somebody? The clerk at the counter asked as I laid out my $10 bill. Y yes, ma'am, it's for Bobby. Nice lady smiled, and then I told her how Bobby really, really needed a coat. I didn't get any change back from my $10 bill, but she put the coat in the bag and she smiled and she wished me Merry Christmas. That evening, Grandma helped me wrap the present and put ribbons on it and, 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 and a tag fell off the coat and Grandma picked it up and tucked it away in her Bible and on another tag, she wrote to Bobby from Santa. Grandma said that Santa always needed helpers and he always needed helpers who could do it in secret. She drove me over to Bobby's house, explained that as we went, I was now officially one of Santa's helpers. Grandma parked down the street from Bobby's house, and she and I crept up noiselessly, and we hid in the bushes by the front walk. Then Grandma gave me a nudge and said, All right, Santa helper, get going. I took a deep breath. I dashed for the front door. I threw the present on the front step. I pounded on the doorbell a few times, and I ran back to the bushes with Grandma. <laughs> Together, we waited breathlessly for the darkness to be overcome by the light of a door opening. Finally it did, and there stood Bobby. He couldn't believe a present with the letters Bobby on the front. I'll never forget him pulling the coat out of the box and putting it on and feeling warm. Fifty years has not dimmed the thrill of those moments as I sat shivering by Grandma in the bushes. That night I realized those awful rumors about Santa Claus and Jesus were just what Grandma said. They're ridiculous. They do exist. I was blessed when my grandma died to be given her Bible. And I found inside her Bible a coat tag that said 1995. Santa's got helpers we don't even know about. And I hope Jesus has helpers that others don't even know about. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your incredible gift. Thank you for the writings of Paul that I believe are most appropriate for a Sunday like today. And I pray, Father, that we will we will allow you to shape our attitude and we will recognize that Christmas is not a date, but it's a state of mind. And if our mind is not where it needs to be, then may we allow you to renew it so that it will be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Have a good day, guys. Merry Christmas.